This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit garynorth.com forward slash free books to download this book in PDF. Who owns the family? God or the state? Written by Ray R. Sutton. 1986. Co-published by Dominion Press, Fort Worth, Texas and Thomas Nelson Incorporated, Nashville, Tennessee. Dedicated to Mrs. Anna Falconer Woolsley, my grandmother, and Mrs. Joretta Williams, my mother, who first taught me Christ in word and deed. Marriage, ordained in paradise, had time and history in view. Because history is movement, it entails birth, maturity, and death. Each generation fulfills its destiny, and another resumes the pilgrimage of history, which is man's destiny and privilege. When God instituted marriage in Eden, before any parents existed, he ordained, quote, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. End quote. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. The significance of this verse is very great. The past must be honoured. Honouring parents involves sometimes their support economically, as needed. But a man must leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. He must break with the one institution to create another. The old authority must be honoured, but history must move forward. The old authority is honoured at God's very specific commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16. But the honour of the old requires the creation of the new authority. The new husband must establish his own area of dominion in family and calling. The unchanging authority is not of this world. It is the sovereign and triune God and his revealed and infallible word. Man belongs to time and to history and, as long as he is in time, he must remain in history. It is the perversity of sin which makes men denounce heaven and eternity and then work to negate time and history by trying to convert it into heaven. The result is hell on earth. R.J. Rushduni Editor's Introduction by Gary North Quote, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. End quote. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 God has established three institutional monopolies, family, church and state. Each of these is a God-ordained government. Each of these is a covenant. There are only three institutional covenant governments. A covenant is always marked by an oath, either explicit, a church, family, or sometimes implicit, state citizenship, and sometimes explicit, state law court. Each of these three governments is to protect the other, and each deserves protection from the other. The oath is central to any covenant. It involves calling down the wrath of God on the oath takers in time and in eternity for any violation of the terms of the oath. When the people's fear of God's judgment when violating the terms of the oath declines, the power of the covenant institution also declines. In the 20th century, The premier institution in the minds of most people is the state or civil government. We live in the era of the power religion. The power religion teaches that might makes right and therefore might is right. The logical goal obviously is to seek power. If anyone chooses not to seek power then he becomes tempted by the other great religion of the day the escape religion, that person seeks to get away from those who use power. There is a third religion, biblical dominion religion. It seeks God's comprehensive kingdom, a visible as well as invisible kingdom that is governed by God's revealed law. Its supporters act in the confidence that all other things of value will be added unto those who seek to establish God's kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. 
This third religion is, at last, experiencing a revival. It has slept for over 300 years. It is a threat. No, it is the threat to the power religionists. Weakened covenants. Sadly, the institutional church is simply not taken seriously these days, either by the humanists or the average church member. The church's covenant-based threat of excommunication doesn't scare many members, especially Protestants. Churches refuse to honour each other's excommunications and, as a result, they have stripped their own authority to just about zero. Now that they find themselves increasingly under siege by the local taxman, the educational bureaucrat and even the prosecuting attorney, for example the Oklahoma case of a church successfully sued by a self-acknowledged adulteress because the church excommunicated her, they have begun to discover the price of historic impotence. Church officers no longer believe that they, as ordained church officers, possess the God-given power and responsibility before God provisionally to cast men into hell, unless these condemned people publicly repent. They no longer believe Christ's words to church officers, quote, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, end quote, Matthew 18, 18. Having lost faith in their power provisionally to condemn men's eternal souls, they have also lost faith in the institutional authority of the church. But if church officers have lost faith in this crucial power of the church, what protection can they expect today from the self-imposed fear of pagans? This leaves the family as the covenant institution that people think is able to defend itself from the unlawful encroachments of state power. But family authority is also under siege. Like the loss in authority that the church has suffered, the loss in family authority has come as a result of the very members of the family having abandoned their fear of God, under whom the marriage oath was taken. Divorce rates have soared, a public announcement of people's lack of covenantal fear in God. Family members no longer believe that a vow taken before God has any permanent meaning, let alone any threat of judgment. The oath taken before God has lost its power outside of the civil government's courtroom, where perjury is still a punishable offence, punishable by the state though not by God, men assume. Men now fear only those who can kill the body. Thus, the loss of faith in the God who enforces all three covenant oaths in history has led to the monopoly of state power in history. The state can kill the body, or at least sentence the body to prison. Since men no longer believe in the earthly or eternal validity of any institutional manifestation of God's power to destroy both body and soul in hell, the oaths of both church and family are regarded either as irrelevant or relevant only when backed up by state power. This state covenant is the only covenant that anyone pays much attention to today. The church has slid down the slope into cultural impotence. The family is close behind. Only the state remains as a force to be taken seriously in history. And history is increasingly the only thing that anyone takes seriously. A shift in opinion. In the last two decades, there has been the beginning of a change in opinion. Christians and non-Christians alike have begun to recognise the historical threat of a collapsing family structure. They have begun to see what Stalin saw in 1936 when he pragmatically imposed rigorous civil laws that protected the Russian family against the acids of original Marxist theories that favoured free love and the abolition of the family. He saw that Marxism's theories of the family would destroy the Soviet Union so the new laws made divorce difficult 
abortion illegal and homosexuality a one-way ticket to the Gulag archipelago. Only after 1964 did the Soviets reverse this Stalinist pro-family heritage at exactly the same time that the humanist assault on the family began in earnest in the West. All over the West in 1965, pro-abortion literature began to pour off the presses. The Rockefeller and Ford Foundations spent over 246 million, 1965 to 76, to promote family planning propaganda. Simultaneously in the United States, the independent Christian school movement went into high gear. Well, second gear anyway. A growing number of Christians at last realised the truth of what the church historian Sidney Mead had said. Quote, the public school systems of the United States is its established church. End quote. They finally decided to pull their children out of the humanist established church, a church coercively financed at the expense of 60 million Christians. The astounding success of the pro-family ministry of James Dobson, author of the best-selling book, Dare to Discipline. He receives 150,000 letters per month and the media ignored success of Bill Gothard's sports arena filling but unadvertised seminars, basic youth concepts, indicate that Christians have begun to restore their confidence in the family as a covenant institution. The possibility of a breakdown in the family is not just a danger close to home, it is a danger to the home. A collapse here cannot be ignored the way a collapse of church authority can be ignored for a while. A declaration of war What a growing number of Christians have begun to understand since 1980 is that their renewed support of the family necessarily involves them in a war against the state. The state has encroached steadily on family authority for over a century and fearfully since 1965. Thus, what may initially appear to be merely a defence of the integrity of the family necessarily leads to an offence against unlawful state power. It is the war between two irreconcilable religions, the religion of the Bible and the religion of state-deifying secular humanism. There can be no permanent peace treaty between the two camps. There will be winners and losers on earth and in eternity. The humanists are going to be the losers, not simply in eternity, but also in history. Fearful, retreatist Christians refuse to believe this, so they stay on the sidelines of life, as they have stayed for over a century. They will continue to cry out to the forces of the Dominion religion to pull back, to cut another unworkable deal with the humanists, and to content ourselves with a ceasefire. Ceasefires with Satan don't last either with the public schools or the Soviet Union. There is a war to the death going on. This book is a call to Christians to join the winning side.